Our first roadside geology stop will come at mile marker 7 on Highway 4 after crossing the Rio Grande and beginning our ascent up the Pajarito Plateau. We'll begin our Google Air flight, however, at Diablo Canyon, approximately halfway between Santa Fe and Los Alamos. Long before the canyon, Volcan Diablo erupted here about two and a half million years ago. Most of the volcano is represented by the butte on the north or right side of the canyon. The eruption began explosively as rising magma from the mantle encountered a saturated groundwater table of the ancestral Rio Grande. The last gasp of the eruption formed a molten lava lake on the south end of the volcano's crater. This funnel-shaped magmatic pool slowly solidified into solid basaltic rock. Fast forward two and a half million years and erosion has fortuitously carved an impressive canyon through the core of the lava lake, exposing massive columnar jointed basalt cliffs that are popular for the rock climbing crowd. As we begin to fly over Diablo Canyon, the Rio Grande and White Rock Canyon come into view. The Rio Grande has been carving this canyon over the past two million years and we will gradually turn north and head up river for a few miles. The Buckman Well Field is located on the east side of the river, providing Santa Fe with roughly one-third of its potable water supply. Ottawa Peak, a volcanic twin of Volcan Diablo, also formed approximately two and a half million years ago. Below us now is the famous Ottawa Bridge crossing the Rio Grande. This is where Edith Warner operated a tea house that hosted many of the Los Alamos scientists during the Manhattan Project. Heading westward, Highway 4 begins to ascend the Pajarito Plateau, rising through progressively younger sedimentary and volcanic strata. As we pause here and look down on the highway, we can see that there is a white layer on top of a dark layer exposed in the road cut on the north side. This will be our first stop on today's tour, where two volcanic rocks on opposite ends of the magmatic spectrum are juxtaposed. A white frothy pumice deposit resting right on top of dark dense lava. The contrast in color, texture, and density is impressive. Our primary interest at this stop will be the pumice deposit, as this represents the beginning of a massive volcanic eruption in the Jemez Mountains, one that would produce a giant volcanic crater, termed a caldera, but not the one you might be expecting. This eruption would form the Toledo caldera approximately 350,000 years before the Valles caldera eruption. The volcanic layers at this stop are more evident when viewed from the other side of the highway. These layers represent the tough deposits from both the Toledo and the Valles caldera eruptions, and are collectively called the Bandelier Tuff. The lower Bandelier Tuff erupted from the Toledo Caldera, and the upper Bandelier Tuff erupted from the Valles Caldera. Let's go ahead and get up close to the rocks and see what clues they can tell us about the beginning of the Toledo Caldera eruption. Okay, we are here uh, on Highway 4, mile marker 7. And we have one of the most amazing road cuts in northern New Mexico. Geologists love the highway department when they expose the rock layer so beautifully as, as they've done here. And this is a very common stop. Uh, you'll often see many different universities, their field camps, they come to New Mexico because we have such great rocks and geology in New Mexico. And you'll often see them stopped right here with all the students scrambling about looking at these amazing different rocks. So we've got this great volcanic layered sequence and right here at highway level we have a very dark volcanic rock which we call basalt and it was emplaced as a lava flow that the magma which was erupted from somewhere off in, to the east of us here but this, this eruption was magma coming straight from the mantle. And because it was coming from the mantle, it was very iron magnesium rich and silica poor. The mantle 
tends to be 50% silica content on average, whereas continental crust tends to be more 70 to 75% silica. So silica is the main ingredient in volcanic rocks that forms most volcanic minerals. And it, it's the component that we use to basically differentiate uh, the types of volcanic rocks. So low silica would be basalt. High silica would be a volcanic rock we call rhyolite. And the higher the silica content, the more you have typically light colored. So this whitish, very kind of pebbly looking rock above on top of the basalt is rhyolite. So we have a rhyolite layer right on top of a basalt layer and it's very, could not have two more different types of volcanic rocks. This, when we get a, a radiometric age on it, gives us an age of about two and a half million years ago. And we know the eruption vent was off from the east. It poured across the landscape and solidified as this hard iron magnesium rich basalt. So this is gonna be the surface of the landscape for about one million years before this next layer is deposited on top of it. So let's go ahead and come up, up there and take a look at what this layer is. Hopefully I won't kill myself. But this is, this is really amazing. When I look at this deposit here, you can pick out the individual pieces and these are volcanic pumices. So pumice is essentially volcanic popcorn. Uh, each one of these pumice, tiny drop of magma that during a very explosive eruption, that drop of magma froths, expands, vesiculates, becomes very airy. And so this particular layer we have here to 1.6 million years ago. Uh, we call this layer the Guaje Pumice Deposit, and it represents the beginning of one of the most explosive eruptions in the history of the Jemez Mountains. Uh, this eruption is going to begin one day, 1.6 million years ago, and the magma chamber for this eruption uh, was basically melted continental crust, so very silica rich on the order of 70 to 73% silica. And you tend, the higher the silica content of, of a magma, often you get the most explosive eruptions. So this is going to be the beginning of an eruption that's gonna produce a giant crater in the middle of the Jemez Mountains. Uh, this crater, uh, we now call the Toledo Caldera. And basically any volcanic crater that is many kilometers in diameter, uh, we refer to as a caldera. So in the history of hundreds and probably a few thousand eruptions in the Jemez Mountains, two of those eruptions were really massive and created volcanic craters you know, 8 to 10, 12 miles in diameter uh, from those two eruptions. One was 1.6 million years ago, and then the younger one's going to be 1.25 million years ago. The younger one's going to produce a crater we call the Valles Caldera, whereas the older one, which is this one here, produces a caldera we call the Toledo Caldera. So what this deposit tells us is when the Toledo Caldera eruption begins 1.6 million years ago, there was a single vent in the central Jemez Mountains that this large silica-rich magma chamber that had formed finally began that eruption. And it was probably triggered by an earthquake, the beginning of the eruption. But once it starts, the initial eruption had a single vent that was extremely powerful. And it was shooting this magma up 25, 30 kilometers, probably even higher 
beyond the atmosphere, troposphere, into the stratosphere. And this powerful, powerful single vent, the magma is basically being obliterated. It's so powerful, shooting up, and all the particles, as they get higher and higher, begin to separate, and they begin to cool. The basic components of that eruption column are going to be super, super tiny fragments of the magma that are going to solidify to be volcanic ash, uh, larger little lumps of magma that are going to be different sizes of pumices, but also a tremendous amount of crystals. Uh, the magma chamber for this eruption had about 40% crystals just kind of peppered throughout the magma chamber. And these crystals are dominantly either quartz or a potassium feldspar we call sanidine. So it's, it's quite remarkable. This magma chamber was 40% crystals, 60% melt, and yet it still was able to have this massive eruption. So for about 20 feet here, what this pumice deposit tells us is that this single vent was going for many hours, you know, probably more than 12 hours, this single vent was going 30 kilometers high. And it also tells us that on the day of the eruption, it was very windy. And the wind was blowing to the southeast towards Texas. And when you have a volcanic eruption, that's shooting magma way up into the stratosphere. As the particles start raining back down, wind becomes a very important factor in the distribution of, that, of these magma particles. And because pumice is light, but the ash is even lighter, as it's raining back down through this wind, the wind immediately starts taking all these lighter particles off in the direction to the southeast towards Santa Fe and all the way into Texas. And so this particular deposit here, there's virtually no ash. There's virtually no crystals in between the pumices. It's just pumice. So we're close enough to the vent that all the fine lightest particles are getting sifted out and keep on going to the southeast. But these pumices are large, dense, heavy enough that they're raining down on the landscape here. Now, if we go to the western side of the caldera or, or of the Jemez Mountains, uh, we don't find this deposit at all because this is a wind-driven deposit. And so that wind, which was blowing to the southeast, that's where you find the thickest. So this is about as thick as it gets and about 20 feet thick. And this phase of the eruption probably went on for 12 to 16 hours. And then we had a fundamental change when instead of one single vent tapping into this magma chamber, multiple vents are going to start tapping into the magma chamber and they're going to start producing a deposit we call a pyroclastic flow that I'll talk about on the next stop. But basically, when volcanic material is raining down from the sky and just accumulating layer by layer, just as a snowfall would, would accumulate, we call that a tephra deposit. T-E-P-H-R-A, tephra. And so this is a tephra deposit. And because these pumices are already cool when they hit the ground. It's not welded together. So I can come in here and just pick these pumices right off. They're not really welded. So lots of life in the Jemez Mountains was surviving this initial phase of the eruption. It's very analogous to the eruption of, of uh, Vesuvius in 79 AD. And the people of Pompeii, during that initial phase, tephra from that eruption, ash, pumice, was raining down on Pompeii and accumulating. It was starting to weigh down roofs. People were even on roofs shoveling. 
getting the pumice and ash off to keep the roofs from collapsing. But then uh, a, a different phase of the eruption is going to begin and that's where it really turns catastrophic and it's going to wipe out all life, vegetation, animal life in the Jemez Mountains. And that boundary at the top of this pumice, about 20 feet above me, you see a lighter beige volcanic rock, which <coughs> you lose the stratification. And that deposit up there represents a pyroclastic flow, which we'll talk more about in the next stop. Together, this tephra, the Guaje tephra, and the pyroclastic flow on top of it, that relates to the eruption of the Toledo caldera 1.6 million years ago. If you look at the orangish pink cliff rocks up higher, those are the pyroclastic flows from the younger Valles caldera at 1.25 million years ago. So we'll, um, we'll take a look at these pyroclastic flow deposits in the next stop. So just keep in mind, the Guaje Tephra tells us that when this eruption began, probably in the spring, that's where we have our most common, really windy days, and the wind was blowing very strongly to the southeast. All the fine particles get sifted out and keep on transporting, but the larger pumices are raining down on the landscape. But then when the eruption really turns cataclysmic, we start producing pyroclastic flows, and that's what we'll talk about next. <laughs>